Hello, and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast exploring Japan's place in the world. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the University of East Anglia, in collaboration with the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures. We aim to not only bring you discussions with leading figures in Japanese studies, but also to reveal the diversity of the field through the range of disciplines that come together in the study of Japan. My name is Oliver Moxham. I'm the project coordinator at the Center for Japanese Studies and host of this podcast series, as well as a master's student at UEA in cultural heritage and museum studies with a focus on Japanese war museums. Our first guest is the director for the Center for Japanese Studies and executive director of the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, Professor Simon Kainer. Simon specializes in the archaeology of prehistoric Japan, in particular the Jormon period, but has also been working in his capacity as executive director to raise the profile of Norwich as an established center for Japanese studies through exciting collaborations and programs with numerous organizations and individuals in Japan. Simon, where do you think Japan fits into the broader field of archaeology? Well, um, there's more archaeology. There are probably more archeo- known archaeological sites in Japan uh, than most other countries in the world. And there are certainly very large numbers of archaeological practitioners in Japan. And that's been the case for a long time now. And there have been huge resources poured into um, archaeology, since, especially since the 1960s, 1970s, and the development boom that took place there. Um, and yet it's a field of activity which is very little known um, outside of Japan. And some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years has been very much thinking, what is the significance of the material record of the Japanese past as it's been uncovered um, over those decades? What is the significance of that for a more global history of humanity? And so many of the projects that we've been doing have been comparative in nature, uh, finding examples from Britain and from other places around the world um, to then shine a bit of a light on what's happening in Japan and seeing how the patterns and processes that we can perceive in the Japanese archaeological record can contribute to that more global history. I see. And uh, what sort of comparative examples do you have? Well, we've been at the moment, we're working on um, some some specific ones. Uh, One is looking at uh, prehistoric stone circles um, in Japan that were built during the Jomon period, the later part of the Jomon period. So around about five, six thousand years ago through to about two, three thousand years ago. Um, and um, not many people know that there are stone circles in Japan. People tend to think of stone circles in terms of very famous sites like Stonehenge um, or Avebury and those kind of locations here in the UK. Maybe some of the stone alignments like Karnak um, in France and maybe some of the stone circles like the stones of Stennis or Kalanish up in Scotland. Um, and yet there are um, over a hundred prehistoric Japanese stone circles have been discovered and there's been a lot of work on them, a lot of very interesting recent work and we're looking exploring parallels there with some of the thinking about um, some of the British and European sites. So some of the areas we're looking at are what were these, why why was it that people in prehistory wanted to build these monuments? They were hard to build, it took a lot of effort. Um, Where were they getting the materials from? Uh, What can they tell us about prehistoric ways of thinking and maybe prehistoric religious systems and things like that? Or maybe even prehistoric astronomy in the case of Stonehenge and sites like the Oyu stone circles um, up in Akita Prefecture, for example. And there are remarkable parallels um, to be found there. But to tell the truth, some things I've found as interesting as that is just bringing together the specialists from Japan um, and from outside Japan to explore topics of shared interest. And uh, I think that is uh, leading to some new insights, um, both on the Japanese material and, as I say, on on materials that we know about from other parts of the world as well. Right. So um, a very rich field of research then. so when you uh, compare sites like Stonehenge with stone circles in Akita, um, what sort of uh, similarities do you expect to find? And what, what are, are the ramifications of them being half a world away from each other? 
Yeah, they're obviously, you know, they're separated by getting on for 10,000 kilometers. So that's that's a long way. Um, and there are no direct um, there are no direct connections. So we're not arguing that the uh, the stone circle builders of Akita were influenced by the stone circle builders of, of Wiltshire, prehistoric Wiltshire or anything like that. Um, but there is something in here about there are certain phenomena that happen in the distant past that we do seem seem to be repeated in different parts of the world kind of some of our shared human heritage, I suppose. Um, in terms of what we were expecting to find, so that, that's interesting, really. Um, so we sort of we started out with a number of, of research themes that we thought we could look at. Um, one is um, around why do people in prehistory build these large monuments? What can that tell us about the nature of society at that time? Do we do we need to, the, 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 the construction of these monuments suggests a level of organization that might be surprising rising, um, thinking about periods such a long time ago. Um, and um, we're, so we're, we're sort of giving that some thoughts. As I say, we're giving some thoughts to these ideas about astronomy, how people in prehistory saw their place in the broader universe and how they related their own life cycles and their own um, their own annual uh, rounds of activity to the movements of some of the heavenly bodies and of course obviously at both at Stonehenge interestingly and at uh, some of the Jomon sites there seems to be particular attention paid to laying out laying out sites so they're aligned on things like the uh, the midsummer or midwinter sunrise and sunset um, and other solstices and things like that so sort of tying up human activity with the movements of these celestial bodies they're sort of two Two examples, I suppose, that we're, we're looking at. Right. And um, you said earlier that uh, the sites, the stone circles in Japan are relatively unknown outside of Japan. Um, why do you think that is? Well, one of the big issues with Japanese archaeology is there's a wonderful record. I mean, the, the way that most archaeology is done in Japan these days, the vast majority of investigations are what we call developer led or developer funded or in French there's an expression which is archaeology preventive which means that what you're doing is trying to preserve something of those archaeological sites before they're destroyed uh, by development um, and each one of these sites that's excavated in Japan or investigated in Japan um, results in the production of an archaeological report um, and those reports um, inevitably really are written largely in Japanese. Uh, a tiny fraction of them have, may have a bit of an English summary. And this means, of course, that there's a it, that, that puts an immediate restriction on who can read those reports. Um, and that has been the biggest stumbling block for archaeologists from other parts of the world finding out about Japanese archaeology. It's the language problem. I see. And uh, what efforts are being made to overcome the language problem? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's a hard one. There's a couple of initiatives that I can think of. One is that the um, the NARA National Institute for Cultural Properties has in recent years been building up a an online repository of uh, Japanese archaeological site reports, and that's freely available um, on their website. Um, and that means and it's searchable and you can go in in English or in Japanese, type in site names or artifact types or whatever it is. Um, and you see how much um, information that pulls out of what is now a database of several tens of thousands of reports there. That's one thing. Um, another um, initiative is the is a journal that I co-edit um, on behalf of the Japanese Archaeological Association, the National body for archaeologists called the Japanese Journal of Archaeology. Uh, that is an online, open access, peer reviewed, freely available journal, um, which, which we're encouraging both Japanese archaeologists and indeed archaeologists with an interest in Japanese archaeology from wherever they are um, to publish their research in. So there are two concrete examples. And one last thing that I was involved in a little while ago, which was specifically trying to address the language issue, is that we also have an online dictionary of Japanese German and English archaeological terms, um, which I worked on with a colleague called Werner Steinhaus, one of our research associates at the Sainsbury Institute, um, who has spent many years compiling um, um, a, a sort of a, 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 a meta, a, a huge online resource, um, drawing on other existing 
um, specialist dictionaries like that. And that's there. And so combined taking that um, and using that along with all the clever online translation tools that we've got these days, I see there's no real reason why determined people shouldn't be able to um, extract the information that they now need uh, from Japanese language archaeological reports. I see. So you'd say it's more of a habit of researchers to just focus on reports in their own language? Well, I think to tell the truth, I've always thought that um, people, there's so much published out there in archaeology in general. And of course, there's a huge amount published in Japanese. So that means that Japanese archaeologists will, and they, Japanese archaeologists tend to focus in on a particular period um, in the Japanese archaeological sequence, and they specialize in that, and they wouldn't normally be very happy to write about other periods. Um, and so they tend to read things that are directly relevant to their own research. And I think this is something that's very true with all of us. We tend to read, and there's never enough time to read everything, and mm -hmm. the vast majority of us read things that we're already working on or that are relevant to our particular research questions. We very rarely even get to go to conferences or meetings, especially under lockdown situations like this. Uh, when we go to conferences and things, we tend to go to sessions about things that we're already familiar, perhaps. Um, something I always try and do is go to at least one session about which I know absolutely nothing um, to see if I can't sort of learn something new, get a new perspective on, on perhaps things that are more familiar to me. Right. OK. Brilliant. Just uh, one last question. Um, from a slightly different perspective, uh, comparing our cultural sites in Britain and Japan, um, I think uh, Stonehenge is obviously one of the best known examples of archaeology in the world. And uh, a lot of archaeological sites in the UK, they often turn into uh, heritage sites and then turn into tourist sites. Um, is there a view for the stone circles in Japan to receive the same treatment or are they being protected by the archaeological community from uh, interloping tourists? <laughs> ah, that's a really good question. And in fact, I've just been uh, editing an article this morning, which talks partly about this. Uh, note, Japanese archaeologists are very, very keen where they can preserve um, these important remains in situ or where they are for everybody to go and enjoy them. And that's that's tourists, interested people from Japan and indeed from around the world. And a really nice example of this is the way in which in preparation for a whole series of Jomon sites in northern Japan, which include, I think, three sets of stone circles um, at Oyu, Isedotai and Komakino in Akita and Aomori. Um, these are being prepared for nomination as UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, hopefully over the next couple of years. And as part of that, there's been an enormous effort to um, to build uh, what they call guidance facilities or little on-site museums. And I've been massively impressed by not only the displays themselves, but also the efforts that the curators there are going to to make sure that the interpretive materials are available in English as well as in Japanese. And in fact, not only English, but in other languages, but knowing that most international tourists, whether they're from the UK or indeed from China, which of course is one of the really big um, tourist sources for Japan these days, um, they can largely read uh, signs in English if they can't read them in uh, in Japanese. Right, very impressive. Hopefully we'll get the chance to go and see them soon. Absolutely. <laughs> great, thank you for your time Simon. Okay. You can find the links to mentioned research projects in the description below. If this topic is piqued your interest, Check our new MA program at UEA in Interdisciplinary Japanese Studies to learn more about Japan beyond Japan. Join us next week where we discuss modern Japanese literature with Dr. Hannah Osborne, Senior Lecturer in Japanese Literature at UEA. If you want to hear more from our podcast series, be sure to subscribe for the latest updates. Thank you for listening. <laughs>